from the world of politics. I think we have to look at other ways to pressure the oligarchs. Internal pressure in Russia uh, is one thing that we need to try to exert as much influence as we can. To the world of business. We are already seeing a dampening, a very negative impact actually, of this war and its consequences on consumer confidence and on business confidence. This is Balance of Power with David Weston. From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our television and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. President Biden is in Brussels right now meeting with allies. He's due to meet with the European Council a short time from now, talking about what more can be done to put pressure on Russia with its war on Ukraine. One of our Washington correspondents, she's Anne-Marie Hordorn, is with the president over in Brussels. A short time ago, she had an interview with the Pentagon spokesman, John Kirby, about specifically what the U.S. is doing in deploying forces and what more could be done. The security environment in Europe is now changed and will stay changed, given what Mr. Putin has proven that he's willing to do. Before the war, there were 80,000 American troops in Europe on rotational or permanent orders. Now, there's more than 100,000. And we're not ruling out the possibility that we'll send more troops. Now, these are temporary deployments. And we turn now to our Washington correspondent, Anne-Marie Hordurin, over there in Brussels. So, Anne-Marie, as I say, a very strong interview. I learned a lot from it. Thank you for doing it. Give us a sense more broadly of what the president is doing. What's on his agenda today? Thanks, David. Yeah, and just quickly on John Kirby, he says that this is temporary, but he also noted this is a new security environment in Europe that they haven't seen since the end of World War II. So potentially those temporary troops become long-term deployment. What's happening now is just in the building behind me, the president is wrapping up just 10 minutes ago the G7 meeting. Olaf Scholz is taking to the mic, talking about what was discussed there. Olaf Scholz, the German chancellor, mentioning that energy potentially in the future is something that is being discussed by the G7. But what we do know, David, from a draft statement we have seen is that the G7 is going to point out and have a sharp threat to Vladimir Putin on the use of chemical, biological, or nuclear weapons. And what everyone I'm speaking to here on the ground in NATO in Brussels is that there will be, quote, severe consequences if Putin was to revert to the use of these types of uh, weapons. But, David, that is just the talk. I have yet to get an answer on what those specifics would look like. One of the questions I have just reading the accounts, including and watching some of the stuff you're doing, Anne-Marie, is, is there a connection between the deployment of troops, both NATO troops, because there are more battle groups now being redeployed. You just talked to uh, retired Rear Admiral John Kirby about American troops. Is there a connection between that on the one hand and chemical, biological, nuclear weapons on the other? Is one thought to discourage the other? Potentially, this is a deterrent. And I spoke to the Latvian president who he said there are consequences and they've been discussing them. But he uh, he and his NATO allies and partners are purposely being ambu ambu ambiguous with the with the NATO, with the Putin and the Kremlin for the purpose of they don't want to give Putin what the consequences are up front. Up front. While others you talk to say those consequences are still being discussed. But t potentially, this troop deployment and the bolstering of the eastern flank is one way to potentially try to deter President Putin from using those chemical weapons. There's another question, David, that really needs to be answered. And NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg um, alluded to this, and he said there would be dire consequences to NATO countries if President Putin were to use these weapons. Because what if those weapons were to go across borders and injure those uh, bo bordering countries that are NATO allies like Poland? This is a big question weighing on the leaders here. Do we have, do we know, whether we have real intelligence indicating this would happen, that the, the Russians are preparing for chemical and biological. I know that including in your interview with uh, Rear Admiral Kirby, he said we don't have real indications they're really staffing up on the nuclear front. They warned about that, but no indication they actually are preparing for anything nuclear. Yes, but at the same time, and the Washington Post reported this, and I spoke about it with the press secretary, Kirby, the uh, secretary, uh, Lloyd Austin, as well as General Milley, have pretty much been snubbed recently in a few phone calls, them trying to reach their counterparts in Russia. Um, but at the moment, the U.S. still maintains they don't need to change their nuclear posture and what you see for uh, saber rattling coming out of the Kremlin. But, uh, David, it is clearly a concern that President Putin is even discussing this type of warfare. Uh, Anne-Marie, you're going to continue with the president as he goes to Poland tomorrow. Give us a sense of what he's going to be doing there. 
This is going to be an incredibly more emotional trip, David. This is really the ground zero of the humanitarian crisis that is unfolding due to this war. Since the beginning of the war, which today marks one month exactly, we've seen more than 3 million people from Ukraine flee Ukraine, and then 10 million altogether when you consider all the people that have been displaced from their homes, potentially leaving eastern Ukraine and moving in western, western Ukraine. So the president is really going to go there, speak with his counterpart, and, and see what Poland is doing in terms of the humanitarian effort, which the United States, of course, is sending a lot of money and also going to be welcoming about 100,000 refugees from Ukraine into the U.S. And we finally, uh, when we have uh, events such as we're having in Brussels and then in Poland this week, we always ask about deliverables. What do we walk away with? How will we know what the mm -hmm. deliverables are? It's very difficult, right, when uh, this meeting was also just planned a, a week ago. But these are three extraordinary meetings. It's a G7 extraordinary meeting, a NATO extraordinary meeting, and the president shortly is going to be talking to his European uh, leaders. But what we do know is that the U.S. came in saying they were going to slap more sanctions on Russia. They did so today in oligarchs, defense companies, the state Duma as an entity. That's Russia's parliament. So in terms of the penalties, we are consider continuously see that being ratcheted up. We also saw that from the United Kingdom. But David, Jake Sullivan said tomorrow there will be announcement from the United States on how they're going to help Europe when it comes to energy security. This is one part of the Russian economy that has pretty much been able to withstand the sanctions. And that is because of Europe's deep uh, reliance on Russian fossil fuels, most notably natural gas. And Russia, uh, Europe is just not yet there to cut off the taps. They are too reliant. So potentially tomorrow we can see a deliverable on the energy front. Okay, Anne-Marie, thank you so much. That's our Washington correspondent, Anne-Marie Hordurn, traveling with the president right now over in Brussels. In the meantime, we want to bring in a Democratic senator from Ohio, Sherrod Brown. Senator, thank you so much for joining us. We want to talk about some banking committee things, but first let's continue on the question of Ukraine for a moment. Uh, tell us about the status of uh, changing the trade status of Russia. That's something that people have been impatient about. I saw a report that perhaps Majority Leader Schumer said there's a deal on that. Should we expect that anytime soon? Um, I hope so. I hope so. We I've been working on this with um, Senator uh, Cassidy, Republican from Louisiana, for some uh, starting I think two and a half weeks ago. The holdup is there is some Republican interest in expanding the bill, sort of to other things, and I just think we need to be focused on denying permanent normal trade relations with Russia. I I think this is a bit parenthetical, but what we've done as a nation on pr permanent trade relations giving them China those advantages if, if undermined our manufacturing country. One of the worst things I think we've done in 25 years. That's not this issue today, but we need to move on it quickly. Uh, we need to get the Republicans to, a couple of Republicans to drop their, and their insistence on expanding this into other areas and, and squeeze the Russians as we're doing on these new sanctions. Uh, against the Duma and other Russian political leaders. Senator, let's turn to your status as the chair of the Senate Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee. Uh, one question, of course, on all of our minds here at Bloomberg are those Fed nominees. We're down to four now. When should we expect a vote on the floor on those four nominees? Well, as soon as we can get the vote. There is, um, there is a Republican part partisan opposition to one of the nominees, uh, the first African-American woman on the Fed, she will be. She is, um, every Republican voted no. Some called her not qualified, even though graduate of Spelman, Truman Scholar in Oxford, PhD at Berkeley, always resistance when it's somebody that doesn't look like me on the Fed, always partisan resistance and that too bad. We're gonna do this as fast as we can. There are absences, some absences this week, um, but we will have those those votes coming up as I, I would assume early next week. At this stage, do you rule out, utterly rule out the possibility of separating out Dr. Cook from the other three? I don't have any, I don't think there's any reason to do that. I, I think we move on all of them quickly and uh, it, there's no reason we can't move on them one after another. I guess the question would be to my colleagues, are you going to, are you going to force long debates? We can always shorten debate time but when debate time is lengthened, it's not really to debate, it's to stall and slow walk. And I would hope my colleagues would say, let's just bring them to the floor. Everybody that wants to can speak on them, but don't have all this downtime between votes. Let's do it. We can do it in the space of one day once the will is there from both parties. And that's what I'm insisting on. 
S Senator, I believe you've just come from a hearing on uh, equity in the appraisal process, oversight of what's going on with the banks in their lending practices, particularly mortgages. Uh, well, there's a report, as you know, on Bloomberg about Wells Fargo in particular, that there was a disparate effect in refinancing coming out of the pandemic. Uh, less than 40 percent of the refinancings were approved. I'm not saying there was an intent, but there was a disparate effect. What can be done about this problem? I don't, I don't know if there was intent or not. I'm not I'm not making that judgment, but there is clearly disparate impact. But keep this in mind. Once government locked in, in 1933, government passed a law essentially leading to the 25 then, now 30-year mortgage. Immediately, government imposed working with local governments and local realtors and all, uh, redlining on essentially on black neighborhoods and some immigrant neighborhoods. From 1934 to 1968, 98 percent of FHA loans went to white borrowers. Uh, and, and we still are still recovering from that in many senses. And that's it's one of the reasons we have such segregation. So Wells Fargo, I, I fully support. I've asked the government to um, to investigate this. They should be held responsible if, if the Bloomberg report, which was excellent, by the way, thank you. I'm not kissing up, but it was um, if we can if we if, if what you suggest is real and it's systemic and whether it's purposeful or not, um, it was it was willful in the sense we've seen banks do this before, um, then they need to be held accountable for sure. As you say, Senator, you've asked for a response from the CFPB and others about exactly what's happened there. Have you gotten a response from them yet? No, but we expect them to. I mean, I, we've talked to them informally. They haven't. I mean, you send letters here that takes a while for them to, to answer them formally because they've got a. am not a lawyer, but they've got to check with their lawyers to make sure the response is, is the right way. But I, I expect, um, I don't know, I don't have a prediction or an expectation of what the outcome will be, but I do expect them to get serious about looking at this and, and investigating this. As you look at oversight in this area and possible regulation by the agencies themselves, how do you strike the right balance between, on the one hand, making sure that there is no discrimination at all, which is unforgettable in the process, but on the other hand, not imposing rules that actually have loans going to people who can't repay them? Because we've had some experience in the past with some of that. Well, you've had that with white borrowers and black borrowers. You've had that with with low income borrowers, and you've also had it with middle, middle income and upper income borrowers. So um, I, I think you start with that, but of course you want to do that. But but when we've seen, we've seen cases, there's a case in Cincinnati in a suburb called Loveland where where um, the, the the family got, a, got an appraisal and the realtor was shocked by how low the appraisal was. A black family, they then, the realtor said, let's try something different. They took all the black picture, pictures of of black children, black family members off the walls. They had a person appear at the home as if she were the home homeowner, a white woman, and the appraisal was 20% higher. That's an anecdote to be sure, but anecdotes are elements of data and more and more you're seeing that this is happening. So we've got a lot of work to do and, and your, your cautionary note is, is not incorrect, but we've got a lot of work to do because if, you're, if your appraisal is 25% less than it should have been, right. it means you can save 25% less. You can, um, you when you sell your house for resale, when you borrow against college, all that, you're essentially taking a quarter of your net worth hit, right. or at least right. your home worth hit. And that's that that keeps people further behind. We know that we build a middle class by, by home ownership. That's right. the fundamental tenant, the foundation of that. And right. much right. of America hasn't had a chance to do that the way people that look like me have. Finally, Senator, I know you've taken a lot of interest in that vice chair of supervision role, not the four that are up now, but actually a nominee that you favored, didn't make it through. Uh, you need to get that role filled. How are you going to do that and, as it were, thread the needle? Because you had some difficulties in the past, not just with Republicans, but even with the Democrat, Joe Manchin. How can you get that seat filled with somebody that you think is right for that job of supervising the banks, and yet you well, can get through? Uh, you know what advice and consent means, and president makes the appointment, we can, I can advise him, I can talk to him, so can any other member of the Senate or the public, uh, then we ultimately confirm consent, if you will. Um, so we're talking to the White House about this. But keep in mind, the reason this, this nominee went down was all about the oil industry. When, when oil companies, oppose, when oil companies uh, make a demand in this Congress, one whole political party, a party that essentially doesn't believe in the science of climate change, goes one bird off a telephone wire, they all fly off. And that's what happened. She was, she was defeated. 
I mean, never came to a vote, but she would have not have been confirmed because all 50 Republicans in the end do the bidding of the oil industry. I, that's not a partisan statement. That's just fact. They use dark money. They were doing that to her. Um, they made it personal, which is pretty bad. But more importantly, we lost a real champion who has an expert on cybersecurity, an expert on climate, an expert, the best, most qualified bank. Uh, FTC, I have a member potentially of the of the Federal Reserve than we've ever seen. The kind of qualifications she had were just exemplary. And they should be ashamed of themselves. But when it comes to the oil companies or guns and the NRA, they're, they're never ashamed of themselves. Okay, Senator, it's always a pleasure to have you with us. As Senator Sherrod Brown, Democrat of Ohio. Coming up, Liz Schuler, president of the AFL-CIO, will be joining us. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. In the midst of a worker shortage across the country, it's really affecting the role of unions across the country. Welcome now, Liz Schuler. She's president of the AFL-CIO, representing over 12 million of those workers nationwide. So, Ms. Schuler, thank you so much for being back with us. One of the things that we're all focused on is inflation. I'm curious, when you go into collective bargaining negotiations right now, what is the role of inflation in your negotiations? Well, thank you for having us on the show today, David. And you're absolutely right. When I'm traveling the country talking to workers who are at the collective bargaining table or on strike, uh, costs are going up and they're seeing inflation starting to eat away at the gains they're making. So that's certainly a topic on everyone's mind. And it provides urgency uh, for workers who are negotiating across that table with their employers. And as they see uh, companies raking in, you know, great profits during this pandemic, they just want a piece of that pie. And so it's more important than ever that that collective bargaining process yield results for workers. And what are we seeing in terms of uh, labor management relations across the country? I know there's a teacher strike going on, I think, up in Minneapolis right now. We've got organization efforts with respect to both Amazon and, for example, Starbucks, two of the biggest names. How is the shortage of workers affecting that? Well, we keep saying there isn't a labor shortage as much as there is a shortage of good, high-paying jobs in this country. And you just mentioned a number of uh, different sectors that workers are rising up. They are fed up with making sacrifices during this pandemic and being called essential one minute and then treated as expendable another. And so they are lifting their voices. They are coming together collectively to demand more. And in fact, uh, they made sacrifices sacrifices during the pandemic, mandatory overtime. Uh, we saw workers at Nabisco who were on strike uh, months ago who uh, had worked around the clock to make those cookies and crackers while people were locked away in their homes. But they couldn't get back to their own families because they were working so much overtime. So that's why we saw this uprising last fall. We called Striketober, and it continues today. Uh, and let's go, let's go up to Capitol Hill for a moment, if we could, because we talked a lot over the months and years about the PRO Act, as it's called. Right now, we have a war in Ukraine. We've got uh, uh, fights over presidential nominees to various positions. What happened to the PRO Act? And most specifically, if it were enacted tomorrow, how would it change some of the uh, organizing of attempts across the country? Well... Working people, all they want is a fair shake at work. And they want to be able to provide for their families, um, make a decent living, put food on the table, and take care of their kids. And right now, the economy is broken for working people. And the PRO Act would fix that because it would allow workers to come together without fear, form a union so that they could have more of a voice and more power in the workplace. And labor law right now is tilted in favor of employers. We're seeing it at Amazon, where workers are trying to organize organize, and they've faced intimidation, they've faced threats, uh, they've even been fired for speaking out. And so the PRO Act would actually allow workers to come together without fear, uh, because that's what usually happens when workers try to form a union, is employers don't like it, so uh, they'll do everything they can to discourage it, and that's exactly what we're seeing at Amazon now. And in fact, the ballots mm. uh, for that election are due today, and will be start. they'll start counting on Monday. And what are the prospects for the PRO Act, given what's going on with the Senate? So we are continuing to pass for the PRO Act, of course, uh, in 
Congress, but we're also pushing at the grassroots level because we know the filibuster has blocked progress in the Senate, and we're not going to let that stop us. We are uh, emphasizing uh, grassroots action. So at the ground level, and that's where we know Congress responds best, is uh, when their constituents make their voices heard. And so our members coming together with community partners and allies are pushing uh, in congressional districts all across this country. So whether it's in Congress and continuing to, to push in whatever legislative vehicles there might be, also at the grassroots level, we think that that's where the rubber meets the road. Liz, it's always a real pleasure to have you on. Thank you very much for the time. It's Liz Schuler. She's AFL-CIO president. Still to come, we're going to talk with Democratic Senator Mark Warner of Virginia about what comes next in Mr. Putin's war in Ukraine. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, one of the big questions out there is what's being done to the Russian economy by all these sanctions? And for an answer of what we're seeing in the markets, we turn now to Kriti Gupta. Well, today's a momentous occasion for the Russian economy and for the Russian markets. The stock exchange has reopened after a month. It was only open for about four hours. It was only uh, there were bans on selling uh, from foreigners. There's also bans on short selling. Nevertheless, you did see a, a lot of liquidity essentially get pumped into the market. And that's really where you're seeing the Russian stock market bounced back uh, over 4%. Of course, like I said, they are closed now. But to me, what's interesting here is that this comes after you had Russia come out and say that $10 billion were going to come from its wealth fund. It's unclear if all $10 billion have been invested on day one. Um, but you can really clearly see that there is some of that kind of propping up by Russia. I think uh, the deputy national advisor, Dalip Singh, called it a Potemkin reopening. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is interesting because you are seeing all of these restrictions. So going forward, we have to see just how much kind of room there is for the stock market to perhaps continue to make some of those gains and how much of those investments come from straight within the country. And what happened to the ruble after Mr. Putin decided that he was going to ask for rubles for his natural gas? Yeah, well, not a ton because it's unclear if Europe is actually going to be paying for that. But remember, Europe isn't the only one here. Uh, India, for example, I keep bringing up this example because it's really important. India actually talking about not only buying more Russian barrels at a discount, but paying for it in a Russian uh, ruble versus rupee kind of agreement. And remember, for the stock market, in that time that the market was closed, the rupee, or I should say, the ruble weakened 16%. So that's another boost for the stock market right there. Fascinating. Thank you so much to Kriti Gupta for that report on Russia. Coming up, Douglas Redeker of the Brookings Institution on who is winning the economic war over Ukraine. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on Bloomberg Radio. Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm Guy Johnson in London. Uh, for the penultimate time, we are closing European markets uh, at this point in the US day. Uh, next week, we will return to normal. Uh, Europe, in terms of equity markets today, as we count you down to the close, really can't make up its mind. If you're listening on Bloomberg Radio, the European map is a patchwork of red and green. The FTSE is higher, the CAC is lower in Paris. The DAX is higher, the Austrian market is lower. Nobody can quite make up their mind. And you can understand why with the geopolitical story uh, dominating in the way that it is right now. As we were hearing from Crudy just a few moments ago in her conversation with David, the Russian market reopened today. You can see that over there on the right-hand side, bright green, the European uh, story uh, focused over here, but keeping a careful eye over there. Let's take a look at how the session has developed. This is the story, as you can see. Very tight range, no clear sense of direction. I think the bond market actually was a more interesting story today, uh, where we saw yields once again picking up on both sides of the Atlantic. But equities finding it hard to get a sense of direction. 4.53 for the stock 600, the closing price, down less than one-tenth of one percent. Let's get an idea of the sector story. Maybe we'll get some clarity there in terms of the developments that we're watching. Keep an eye on European banks. In theory, this should be a good environment for them, but they will continue to suffer, and I think this is one you want to pay attention to. But at the bottom end of the heap today, we have retail. Uh, it's down 1.5%. The luxury sector is down by 9 tenths of 1%. Then we get to construction, then we get to travel. But as you can see, it's a game of two halves when it comes to the sector story as well. Basically, the sector story reasonably well split with telecoms up at the top, food and beverage, then chemicals, then the basic resources. So no clear defining trend coming out of that. So let's turn to...
to the single stocks, try and get an idea uh, of whether there's something interesting emerging here. Home serve out of the UK in the utility space are by 15% today. Uh, the Betaville website, which kind of tracks M&A, talking about it on its site, uh, the stock responding to that, up by 15.14% today as a result of that. So M&A continues. But then I think uh, you get to the interesting story, which is where I think you actually can take something away from today's session. Daimler Trucks, uh, one of the world's biggest trucking manufacturers, uh, talking today about the fact that despite suffering shortages and really struggling when it comes to input costs, it's actually reasonably good when it comes to the output costs, i.e. the sale costs. So margins are actually holding up reasonably well. We're seeing this in the car sector as well. Making less actually may deliver more when it comes to shareholders. And you can certainly see that in Daimler trucks as well. Linton Sprungli, you ever in Zurich? Go down the Bahnhofstrasse, I think it's on the right-hand side. This is a global uh, chocolate company uh, with uh, strong links, obviously, to Switzerland. Um, UBS looking at this business today, saying it's got really strong price elasticity, i.e., despite the fact, once again, like Daimler, it's facing input cost problems, it's actually able to pass those on. Uh, unlike luxury, uh, unlike trucks, chocolate is a luxury, and people probably do want it in times that are a little tougher than normal, David. So maybe we're all going to go out and buy some chocolate to make ourselves feel better. That's good news for Linton Sprungley. David, back I'm not you. sure, guys. Some people think chocolate's a necessity. It's not just a luxury. Thank you so much to Guy Johnson for wrapping up the European markets for us there. Well, all eyes are fastened on Europe and Ukraine right now, and specifically with President Biden over there meeting with allies about what more could be done on the sanctions front. To talk to us about those sanctions, we welcome now Douglas Redeker, Brookings Institution non-resident senior scholar, founding partner of International Capital Strategy in Washington, D.C., and he also served at one point on the executive board of the IMF. So thank you so much for being with us. Give us your take on these sanctions, how effective they are so far. Well, I think sanctions can be used basically for three purposes, right? They can be a deterrent, they can be used to negotiate, to give you leverage, or to punish. And I think it's clear that the sanctions that are being rolled out today and that have been rolled out thus far, they were very good at deterring because we have a war going on. I find it very hard to see how they're being used as a negotiating leverage tool. So I think what we're really seeing is these sanctions are being used primarily to punish. And that doesn't mean that they're not also trying to deter future activity or to be used as some form of negotiating leverage to try and get Putin and, and Russia to back off and, and, and do the right thing vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. But really, every escalation that we've seen has been intended to isolate Russia, to undermine their fortress Russia strategy, which was to try and make themselves uh, insulated from potential sanctions, and to basically make it more costly for Putin every day this war continues. But I think that what you're seeing is a long-term uh, impact on the Russian economy. And I think we live in a time where most people like to see short-term results. So when you have export controls, when you have uh, all of the, the ruble uh, impediments for the central bank, these are not things that are going to manifest in people's lives on a daily basis. But boy, this is a big package of sanctions the U.S. and Europe and the other G7 members have levied on Russia. It's just going to take time for people to actually see how they manifest. But make no mistake, this is a major set of sanctions, and we keep seeing more and more and more. It's just the impact is going to take some time for Russian individual lives and politicians to have to, have to respond to them. So, Douglas, as you say, all of us are impatient. We like uh, quick results. Uh, we may not always get them. At the same time, in this situation, there's a particular problem, which is that people are dying every day, and the hope would be to sort of have fewer people die. From what you say, it sounds like uh, it's not likely that sanctions are likely going to change the course of this war over the near term. By near term, I mean months. Yeah, well, I would call near-term weeks, but let's call it months. I think the problem, if we can call it a problem, is when you've got a, a shooting war where Russia is using its military and the U.S. and NATO have said explicitly, we are not going to engage militarily, right? We're trying to avoid the World War III scenario for obviously a good reason. Then what we're using is the best hard power equivalent we have which are economic and financial sanctions against someone who is firing rockets and missiles and dropping bombs and shooting at people in Ukraine. So we're arming them defensively. That's our defensive response to their military. But no, sanctions are not really going to be the equivalent deterrent to Putin's war machine 
trying to level cities and committing war crimes across Ukraine. It's not exactly the fair fight because we're, I'm not saying it's the wrong policy decision, but we have said we're not going to engage militarily at the NATO level against Russia. So what we're doing is trying to impose longer term costs over shorter term aggression. And yeah, if you're looking at it in a matter of weeks or months, that's not a dispro that's not a proportionate response. Douglas, what about the prospect of getting some help from a third party like, for example, China? Uh, could China take action that might change Mr. Putin's mind? Well, the, the, that's the big question. I think we in the U.S. and other NATO and, and European allies have been hoping that President Xi and others in Chinese leadership will realize it is in their self-interest to actually try and rein Putin back in, because the longer China is seen as being complicit, right? We use the phrase pro-Russian neutrality. Well, it's not neutral if they're pro-Russia, and they seem to be tilting towards Russia. The longer China is seen as being complicit with, China, with Russia, then the more they are putting their own economic self-interest at risk. The two biggest markets for China are obviously the US and the EU, and the longer they are seen as being pro-Russia neutral, then the more they put those trade relationships at risk. So we are trying politically, diplomatically, and economically to prevail on China to say it's in your own interest to actually try and rein Putin in. To date, that has not been terribly successful, but that's the great hope. It might not even be successful if President Xi did lob in a phone call to President Putin and mm -hmm. say, time to wind this down. But mm -hmm. that's our big hope. Douglas, finally, we have a tendency to think that uh, we're on the good side, Russia's on the bad side, and pretty much the whole world's on our side. But in fact, there are a lot of countries that are not in the EU or not Russia or not the United States. Where's the rest of the world in all this? Well, so the rest of the world is sort of hanging back. I think there was some comfort that at the UN General Assembly, the vote was disproportionately against Russia's invasion. But if you look at sanctions, there are 172 or 173 nations that are in Asia, Latin America, um, and Africa, and a grand total of two or three of them have actually joined us on sanctions. So I think a lot of them are acting in their own self-interest and waiting to see how this plays out. A big country like India not only has a strategic relationship with Russia, but they're in the market buying Russian oil at a big discount because it's in their self-interest to do it. So, you know, International Relations 101 talks about we don't have friends, we have interests. And the interest right now for a lot of these countries is to act in a way that is short-term beneficial to them and wait and see how this plays out. Douglas, really appreciate you being here. That was very helpful. It's Douglas Redeker of the Brookings Institution. Coming up, the last days of hearings, the last day of hearings on Judge Katanya John, Katanji Brown Jackson. What we learned this week and what will happen to her going forward. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Today is the fourth and final day of confirmation hearings for Judge Katanji Brown Jackson at the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee for her appointment, her nomination to be a Supreme Court justice. And each day it seems to have gotten a little hotter, at least as I've watched it. But for his report, because he's up there, we turn now to Washington correspondent Joe Matthew. He's the host, of course, of Sound On weekdays on Bloomberg Radio. Joe, thanks so much for being with us. What is going on today? Well, this is the fourth and final day here, David, of course, and the waters are a lot calmer in the Senate Judiciary Committee as they have been for the last couple of days. This one is this session dedicated to outside witnesses, including the American Bar Association, which has given Katanji Brown Jackson its highest professional rating of well qualified. And in fact, in testimony this morning, one of the, the, the lawyers on the bar who evaluated Judge Jackson for this purpose said there is no evidence to support Republican claims that Judge Jackson is soft on crime. Now, this follows two days of rather intense questioning, namely from Republican members of the Judiciary Committee, who not only framed Judge Jackson as soft on crime, but also sympathetic to pedophiles and supporting critical race theory. A lot of issues that we didn't think we'd be hearing about in this process. The chair, Dick Durbin, saying at the start of the session this morning that the line of questioning was unfair, unrelenting, and beneath the dignity of the United States Senate. And Republican Senator Ben Sass of Nebraska had his own take on his colleagues' behavior. Let's listen. We should recognize that the 
jackassery we often see around here um, is partly because of people mugging for short-term uh, camera opportunities. And it is definitely um, a second and third and fourth order effect that the court should think through um, before it has advocates in there who are not only trying to persuade you nine justices, um, but also trying to get on cable that night uh, or create a viral video. This, of course, will not be the last time that elected officials use high-profile hearings to try to get on the news or create campaign advertising fodder. That's nothing new here in Washington. As we look forward, though, David, to the rest of this process, we expect a vote in the committee on April 4th. It is entirely likely that by the time this gets to the floor, and Judge Jackson at this point is expected to be confirmed, it could be along party lines. And in fact, one of the closest votes ever in the history of a Supreme Court nomination, David. Yeah, just to editorialize for a minute, yeah, as you know, I spent some time at the Supreme Court, and that's exactly yeah. the reason the Supreme Court has never wanted televised oral arguments, because they were afraid that the advocates would be mugging for the cameras rather than answering the question. So Senator Sass has a point, from my point of view, at least. Uh, at true. the same time, uh, is, she good, is she going to get any Republican votes? Going into this, people thought there were two, maybe three, even more. Is she going to get right. any Republicans' votes at this point? Remembering, David, she got three in her last uh, time being confirmed here for what the circuit court judge position. The answer right now appears to be no. We'll find out in a couple of days if this evolves, but based on the language we heard from Minority Leader Mitch McConnell yesterday, the Republican Party is getting cover here to completely turn away from Judge Jackson, despite the fact that it will not change the makeup of the court. Okay, Joe, thank you so very much. That's our very own Joe Matthew. And once again, he's host of Sound On every day of the week at 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Bloomberg Radio. Coming up here, Senator Mark Warner of Virginia on what we know and don't know about what comes next in the war in Ukraine. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, President Biden, of course, is in Brussels right now meeting with allies, discussing the sanctions that have been imposed, possible new sanctions, tightening the ones we have. And one of the topics of conversation, we we're told, is the possible use by Russia of chemical, biological, or even conceivably nuclear weapons and how the allies could prepare for that. We welcome now Mark Warner. He's Democratic senator from Virginia. He's chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee. So, Senator, thank you so much for joining us. We never want to know thank anything you. we're not supposed to know. But what is the degree of risk? And maybe more important, how could we prepare for the possible use of chemical or biological weapons? Well, I think we have to recognize that Vladimir Putin, who's been a dictator for 20 years, has become more and more isolated. Anybody who saw those images of Putin sitting at one end of the table, his advisors are visiting foreign dignitaries at the other. The number of inputs he's getting, uh, I think, has really been limited. I, we were unsure at first whether he was even getting accurate reports of how badly the Russian military was uh, performing in Ukraine. And the fact is that the Ukrainians have turned from how long we, they can hold out to can they even beat back Russia in certain areas. Uh, so I do worry that Putin as a dictator can, and cornered, would he go to chemical weapons? Would he even consider tactical nuclear weapons? Would he launch an all-out, all-of-the-above cyber attack? These are things where I think we could do a couple things. I think we need to continue to ratchet up the economic sanctions. We've seen that already uh, in terms of sanctioning the members of the Russian Duma, the parliament. I think we ought to go ahead and call out, potentially as war criminals as well, those generals who are leading the attack, bombing those citizens in Ukraine. I think the Biden administration should have made a bigger deal of the fact that they have recently issued a, some additional LNG, liquefied natural gas, export permits here in America so we can try to push our European allies off Russian um, oil and gas. But we've got to help provide them additional sources. American natural gas would be one of those sources. I think we need to look at the areas of crypto to make sure Russian oligarchs are not leaking out their funds uh, through conversion into cryptocurrencies and avoiding sanctions. And honestly, David, I think it's time for some of our allies uh, great nations, India, I'm co-chair of the India Caucus, Israel, I have been a, one of the most ardent supporters of Israel throughout my time in the Senate, but great democracies like them sitting on the sidelines, not calling out Russian aggression, you know, this is not a close case of good guys and bad guys. There is a dictator who is butchering innocent civilians, 
And there are democracies, not just in NATO, the president's got to navigate as well with the G7, including Japan, but other great democra democracies around the world need to get in, at least calling out and helping sanction uh, these potential activities. Senator, as chair of the Intelligence Committee, how confident are you that we will know if, in fact, Russia uses chemical weapons, particularly chemical? Because I've read that some toxic chemicals like chlorine and ammonia are associated with agricultural products. There are plants in Ukraine that manufacture that. Is it possible we'll not be sure? David, I am confident that within a, I can't say within minutes or within a few hours, but we will know the evidence and the, the hideous barbarity of, of using chemical weapons and the effect it has on human beings, um, I, there will be evidence. And, and I think um, NATO needs to be more definitive on that red line. But as we know, if, a, if an alliance draws a red line and that's crossed, you have, then have to invoke uh, consequences. And I think one of the things that President Biden has been so far carefully navigating is let's get arms to the Ukrainians, 20,000 anti-tank uh, tools, uh, increased surface-to-air missiles, including the SA-300s, much more advanced, uh, additional small arms. The Ukrainians are, are doing a good job with them, over 50 airplanes. The Ukrainian Air Force is still flying. Um, but we've got to make sure that we don't splinter that alliance if you suddenly have some nation saying, hey, you know, I'm not in on consequences or I'm not in on ratcheting up um, uh, military support, because it's been we and the British who've been the most forward-leaning, then that unanimity of support uh, gets a little bit weakened. Uh, Senator, you mentioned some other countries, such as India, for example, and the position they're taking. Talk to us about the G20. There's talk about whether Russia should be excluded from the G20. I understand they have meetings coming up in October. Mr. Putin says he's going to show up no matter what in Indonesia. Indonesia says he's welcome. Uh, what is the likelihood there could be a splintering of G20? And in fact, if there's a division, is that in and of itself a win for Vladimir Putin? If Vladimir Putin is still killing innocent civilians, in Ukraine literally months from now, uh, I don't see how any so-called civilized nation would allow him to participate in any kind of group or meeting of world leaders. I mean, uh, th what the Ukrainian folks are doing, I think all of us as Americans ought to take a deep breath and, and think about this a little bit. You know, we've been, we've had some pretty challenging political times recently. We've all gone through COVID. Um, you know, I think many of us have asked, I know on Bloomberg there's a lot of questions. Can our kind of liberal democracy, capitalism, you know, win, win the worldwide challenges versus autocratic states or against the Chinese economy? The Ukrainian people are voting with their lives, saying we will give our lives for a free press, for an access to free markets, for the right to vote, for the right of freedom of expression. This is so much bigger than simply Putin's cruelty against the Ukrainian people. This is really whether democracies mm -hmm. and free enterprise systems around the world are going to stand up mm -hmm. or whether they're short-term profits that may come about from buying or ch helping Russia out with some uh, ruble exchanges is worth paying that kind of a long-term historic price. And finally, Senator, you have a history of really being concerned with cyber security, cyber attacks. We heard President Biden this week really invoke the American company saying, you've got to help us. Are we ready? I think we are ready. I, as a matter of fact, David, this has been the dog that didn't bark. I've been amazed that Russia hasn't launched more extensive cyber attacks in Ukraine that go beyond individual networks. I'm, I'm amazed that the Internet is still up, that we're still getting these incredible images out of Ukraine. But, you know, unlike the Russian military forces, which clearly haven't been able to execute, the Russian cyber team, they put their top team in. Uh, we've seen it with the yeah. kind of cyber ransom crime. Uh, right. I think we will be ready, but uh, they could get in. We've got to be resilient. One of the things that we've right. added a new tool, right. which is to make sure we've got mandatory cyber reporting so we know when it happens. Outstanding. Thank you so much to Senator Mark Warner, Democrat of Virginia. Check out the Balance of Power newsletter on the terminal and online. And this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg.